Welcome back to Psychedelics Today. Thanks for listening. This is Joe. Today on the show, we have Emma Bragdon, PhD, founder and executive director of Integrative Mental Health for You. We had a great conversation and really hope you enjoy it too. We get into some stuff about integration and generally psychology of the future, some stuff about MDMA psychotherapy, and, and maybe some critiques about uh, leaders in the field not proposing certain items when they have the opportunity. Uh, Emma's academic and practical training, um, she a PhD in transpersonal psychology from the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology, recently renamed Sophia University. I actually looked at ITP for a bit, didn't pull the trigger for whatever reason. Also, she has advanced training in process-oriented psychotherapy, neo reikian therapy, breathwork, past life regression, bioenergy therapy, and developing intuition. So really great interview. I think you'll like it. It's a different approach than what we've had to date, and I think it's wonderful. Enjoy it and let us know what you think. Info at psychedelicstoday.com or psychedelicstoday email at gmail.com. It's also a contact form on our site, um, psychedelicstoday.com. If you want to support the show, feel free to give us a review on iTunes or just let your friends know about Psychedelics Today. That's probably really the best, just telling people about it and uh, that it's been interesting or helpful for you to understand the field better or get some new perspectives on the field. So anyway, thanks for listening. Enjoy the show. Take care. Welcome to Psychedelics Today with your hosts, Joe and Kyle. Today we have Emma Bragdon um, from Integrative Health Integrative Health for You. Is that correct, Emma? Sorry, integrative, was, mental, me- integrative Mental Health for You. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thanks for joining us. Um, so I actually did uh, a spiritual emergence coaching program with you. And I think that a lot of the content that was presented in the course is really relevant to the topic of psychedelics. And the language of working with spiritual emergencies um, can really translate well to working with psychedelics and aftercare and integration. So I thought it'd be great to have you on the show to talk about this. And um, so thanks for joining us. A pleasure to join you. I'm, I am I was so glad when you became certified as a spiritual emergence coach and brought into our discussions everything that you've been studying and learning about, including the psychedelic movement. And I feel um, like it's a real gift to be able to be here with you today yeah. and do this podcast. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, So how about we just jump in and um, give us a background on how you got interested in um, the spiritual emergence world and the transpersonal world? Well, that's that's quite a bit of history to it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I guess I would have to go back to a young kid and seeing the display of a dysfunctional family around me, <laughs> as is quite normal in, in uh, Ameri- at least in North American culture. And, um, and, but something galvanized in me early on, like I was under 10 years old, and I just felt like I'm going to find a way of being in this world that just works better. And I didn't even know what I was talking about to myself. So, <laughs> but, uh, but, but something galvanized in me as a really young kid. And then I was interested in philosophy and comparative religions in high school. And so I was, I was really searching. That was what I was most interested in. And then um, when I got into college and I started looking into various new forms of psychology, I started thinking, okay, something interesting is going on. Not so much with behaviorism and Freudian psychology, et cetera, but there's something new on the horizon. Reading Wilhelm Reich and uh, started recognizing that there's not only some, uh, the Eastern philosophers talk about, let's say, alternative realities or larger realities uh, than I knew as having been brought up in a Christian household, but um, but there are these psych- psychiatrists and Wilhelm Reich, uh, who I think came into his work with a with a high degree of training and knowledge, who say there's some kind of universal energy, and if we tune into it and allow it to flow through our system completely, that we're going to be a lot healthier. So I read that and I thought. 
well, that sounds right to me. Right in the Eastern philosophy, right with what he's saying, seems like it's an integration of Eastern philosophy in a way. But then how do you get there? Well, I, I studied breathwork. I studied Reikian work. And I ran into Will um, Stanislav Graf and his work. And um, I thought, okay, some people are getting to it through psychedelics. And um, so I, I was born clairsentient, which means that I'm pretty sensitive. And I found that even inhaling a little bit of marijuana was pr very, very intense for me. I, I described my, an experience, my first experience as someone, they said, that's what people experience on acid. <laughs> And uh, I, so I kind of backed away from marijuana, LSD, which in the 60s when I was growing up was um, more available. But um, when I went to graduate school, and that was in the early 80s, I started recognizing the light in some people's <laughs> eyes, literally. Uh, and I started seeing gee, some of the people in this graduate school look lit up. What's going on here? What are they doing? What class are they taking? You know, <laughs> And I realized uh, after some discreet questioning that the class they were taking was ecstasy. Mm. And, um, and that it wasn't just take it as in go to a rave concert and take it and have a good time, but it was taking it with a psychologist who was using it for psycho-spiritual growth. So um, I, I was fascinated, and by that point in my life, I had already spent four years at a Zen Buddhist monastery. So from the age of 20 to 24, I'd been in a Zen Buddhist monastery, and I was deeply dedicated to meditation. So um, I was very reluctant to have an experience of um, a drug. I just thought this is going to screw up, screw me up because I'm clairsentient and I'm into meditation. This is not a good thing, but I felt like I, I had to do it. There was just something propelling me in that direction. And I had an extraordinary experience. And this was clearly supervised by someone who knew the territory very well mm -hmm. and uh, was totally dedicated to sitting with me. So, um, that got me into the psychedelic movement, but what got me into the transpersonal, I didn't, I didn't uh, completely speak to, which was um, in 1971, when I was um, six and a half months pregnant with my first child, my mother uh, died, and what was told, I was told, was she had killed herself. And the reason she had killed herself was she was confusing enlightenment with, um, with death. Mm. And so she had moved into a really extreme state uh, and didn't have anyone to talk to about it. Um, the, the local doctor, family doctor, had absolutely no training <laughs> in working with people in extreme states. And at that time, so late 60s, early 70s, uh, people were, you know, doctors were just getting used to, well, what are these psychiatric medications and when do you give them and how much do you give and at what point? And so it was, it was uh, not necessarily a good scene at that time for anyone who was in somewhat psychologically disturbed and beginning to explore or experiment with the psych meds. So anyway, my mother's experience um, had a profound impact on me. And Suzuki Roshi, who is a <clears throat> Japanese abbot, Zen Buddhist abbot, actually flew to Vermont and gave the uh, four-day funeral service for my mother. So it was, uh, I was already sensitive. I was then six and a half months pregnant. I went through this extra, extraordinary experience, funeral experience, which was about meditation, but it was also about like, what happened? What did she need? What was she going through? What was the distortion in her mind that could have led her to that um, extreme way of uh, leaving this planet? Mm. And, um, and so, you know, that added a lot of fire 
in me in terms of what are these extreme states about? And prior to that, let's call it synchronicity or coincidence, um, when I'd been in the Zen Buddhist monastery, there had been some people who had gotten into extreme states, as in um, feeling like they could handle all of their personal problems through meditation. <clears throat> and one of them in particular had gone and sat in the middle of um, a busy street in San Francisco to meditate, thinking that meditation would just make him immune to any problem. And another, another person, a woman in this case, where it really was going into a, a state where she couldn't take care of her kids, her family, her house, her, um, you know, really communicate with her husband anymore because she had just gone into such an extreme state. And I was, I was asked to sit with some of these people. Mm. And I was very young at the time, but um, so be it. I was. So I, I wow. have a, a bit of a track record that me- of about 50 years now. Wow, that's, that's great. Yeah. It's such great work to be doing, too. Well, there are not a lot of people who are doing it, but thanks to Stan and Christina Groff, who created the term spiritual emergency and then the Spiritual Emergency Network in 1980, there are more people who've read about it and have gotten into this. So, yeah. And I, 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 just for a little bit of history, I went on to do seven years of volunteer work at the, at the Spiritual Emergency Network. So I got pretty close to what the graphs were about and what the network was about. And um, I was the editor of their journal when it started and edited the newsletter. And so I got got very deeply involved in it. And oh. that was a great boon. Awesome. And then I, also, I, you did a little bit of training with um, the Groffs with breathwork, correct? I did. I only did like a weekend with the Groffs. Oh, okay. the, the person that I wanted to learn about breathwork from was, uh, well, actually, the, the, the couple were Gay and Katie Hendricks, who were at that time living in Colorado. And so I did a, a good amount of training with them in Colorado and also in California. Mm. And then would be leading breath work in the graduate school. And when I later became licensed, I was doing individual work that was more like Reikian work or breath work with individuals. So I, I, I became more conversant with extreme states, if that's if we can say it that way. Because, of course, when people do breath work, they get into some extreme states without any kind of drug at all. But it can right. lead to an extreme state because the body is purging of um, constrictions or stuffed emotions. <laughs> we learn a lot about ourselves when we do breath work and can move to a wholly different place if, if what we go through is resolved and integrated. Yes. Would you say Guy and Kitty Hendricks have a Reikian background or like what was their orientation when you jumped in with them? Well, you know, they didn't talk about Wilhelm Reich when I jumped in with them, but they were definitely moving, helping people move into more expanded states of consciousness. And they felt that the breath work was definitely helpful for uh, getting into your story in order to throw off whatever was keeping you restricted. And so you could move into a more expanded place with your own energy as well as with your consciousness, which is really consistent with Reich. But um, Gay, in particular, has a very different personality than Wilhelm Reich. And uh, Wilhelm Reich looks like a pretty crazed guy if you look at some of the photographs that have, are still around. And, and Gay is, uh, he, he would do well as a stand-up comedian. <laughs> He's very entertaining. And um, I, I can remember one, one time in particular, I was in a training with him, and he started it out by asking us to get in touch with some of the worst trauma that we'd had in our lifetimes. And I thought, oh, God, this is going to sink to a um, pretty dark level. But after we'd gone through a little meditation time, like a few minutes to get in touch with what our story was, he had us sing it as in... Um, I was traumatized at two, do da, do da, <laughs> etc. <cetera. laughs> so the whole group sitting around in a circle was singing the do da song, right? But but embedding it with the trauma that they'd had. So we immediately were 
in tune with the trauma that we'd had, but then on the other hand, lightening up about it, which is something you definitely don't get from Wilhelm Reich. <laughs> right. It's not, it's not a, a light kind of thing that he was doing, but it was profoundly impactful, all of his work. So I'm sure Gay and Katie both read him, as well as the bioenergetic therapists that were popular at the time. Does that answer your question there, Joe? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay. The um, okay. Just uh, that song you gave an example of reminded me of uh, Lenny Gibson, <laughs> who's our mentor. <laughs> he did, oh, they oh. have a little uh, insider song in a similar vein. Oh, really? That's uh-huh. very good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I happened to sing it as a, as a kid. The Camp Town Races, I think is what it's called. Mm. So it really hit uh, a wonderful place when... We were asked to do that song. <laughs> That's great. So, yeah. um, earlier, um, we, before we started recording, we kind of chatted a little bit about MDMA kind of sitting. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. do you want to jump into a little bit of your story around that? Okay. So, um, when I was in graduate school in the early eighties, um, I started noticing, and I went to the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology, which has become Sophia University now, changed its name. So I I noticed that there were a lot of people um, in the school who looked kind of lit up. And I was wondering, what's going on with them? What class are they taking? What, you know, what diet are they on? What meditation are they doing? I kind of was scanning and I just couldn't recognize what was happening with these people. I couldn't find the common denominator. And then after some discreet questioning, I found out that they were um, actually aligned with Shulgin and had access to some very pure MDMA, as well as some extraordinarily good supervision. So they were using this in a, in a very uh, disciplined manner in order to help them expand in consciousness and break down blockages that they might have had so that they are, energy, as Reich would say, energy could run more fully through the body as well as uplift consciousness. Mm. So um, I, I was first shocked because since I've been meditating since I was really 18, uh, and I put in about 20 years at that point of meditation. I thought, no, I, I, I'm not going to go that direction. <laughs> I'm, I, first of all, I know I'm a sensitive and I don't want to get into trouble and I don't want to screw around with my brain. And, uh, and then, though, after time and after getting to know some of these people a little bit more, I thought, well, maybe I'll try it, but only in a circumstance where it would be like a say. A, set up as a sacred experience like I'm dedicated to moving into a zone where um, if it if it helps my spiritual growth fabulous if it doesn't I don't want I, I just don't want to have anything to do with it and I mean spiritual spiritual meaning psychological and spiritual because from my perspective if we're going to grow spiritually we need to attend to all of our psychological story as well. In other words, anything left over that we haven't integrated. So, um, so anyway, I had that experience and it was extraordinary. And from my point of view, the, the pure ecstasy that I had, that I was given, plus the environment that I was in that was extremely supportive because I was with someone who was very well trained, um, contributed to my moving into a state of consciousness that was extraordinary for me, but even more extraordinary was being able to stay in that high state of consciousness for quite a period of time. Mm. And I was out of time. So I wasn't looking at my clock, you know, or my watch going, okay, so how long has it been that I've been in this high state? (laughs) (laughs) That was not, not something I was interested in. So and meaning oriented towards time, but it felt like I was there as a, a, a long enough time that, I mean, this is a metaphor because there's no science that will measure this. But metaphorically speaking, it's as if my the way my brain would function was being reprogrammed. Mm. It was shifting radically. And 
And that's because of spending a period of time with um, being infused with this higher consciousness. So again, I think it was my intention as well as the supervision I had that allowed me to move into that for the period of time that I could. But um, after that first experience, of course, I was extremely interested in, in the power of MDMA in its pure form um, and it being used under supervision, you know, in a therapeutic manner. So I um, had a few other experiences and was also able to sit with other people who were going through it and was stunned by the, not only their experience, but also how I was able to tune into what they needed. And so the training that I had had as a neo Reikian therapist could be employed to assist people while they were on MDMA to let go of past trauma and to move into higher states of consciousness. So I, I considered you know, uh, wow, I guess, I guess I'm good at this. I guess I should do more of this. And then, of course, 1984 and 85 rolled around. I thought, whoops, if I do anything like this, it's going to be illegal and I could be imprisoned and I don't want to go there. So I backed off, which, um, which I think was the right choice at the, at the time. But it's, I'll tell you, looking at the news now and, and just seeing how, pure MDMA taken under good supervision in the right set and setting is clearly um, helping those people like who are veterans coming back from the war, suicidally depressed with post-traumatic stress syndrome, and they're able to have the MDMA under supervision and be relieved of their um, PTSD. That's ex extraordinary that it's happening like that and it's being reported in the New York times. And yeah. uh, so, so that's happy news, but it's still not legal. Right. And, uh, and I, I gather it's quite difficult to be uh, put into one of the pilot programs where you're the therapist and et cetera. Yeah. So, I, I'm really excited about what's going on right now that there's a um, revitalizing and of the looking at the power of MDMA for healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like you and I'm sure a lot of other psychotherapists and people um, in that time range where before it became illegal, you guys had a really special opportunity to um, work with this stuff. And so like having that experience, like – you know, did you uh, watch people kind of resolve trauma and kind of now you could see this like therapeutic use of um, it being used adjunct to psychotherapy? Well, you know, I, I was mentioning that, that the something that I saw I couldn't understand at first was was people being kind of lit up. Mm. And what I mean by that is that people seem seemingly relieved of, of past trauma and more stabilized in terms of having a higher state of consciousness. And the way that would manifest is being more loving, being more compassionate towards others, having a more refined ability to pay attention to um, either oneself or others, having less denial, having less reactivity, having more of a desire to be of service to others. And so when I was seeing that, um, consistently in other people, it was really obvious to me that they'd been through some profound transformative experience. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I, I, and then when I had the experience myself, I could clearly see that the therapeutic setting was very important and the intention of the person as they were taking it was extremely important. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Yeah, we one of our teachers that we had on our podcast, um, they actually went through a session too when it was um, being used therapeutically in the 80s before it became illegal. So yeah, it's always really exciting to hear those stories. Um, mm. It's really it's a really cool piece of history. Well, and and the this the one thing that was going on at that particular time being explored was um, a certain group of therapists getting together and actually doing this in a group. Mm. format. 
mm-hmm. which I haven't heard of being explored again um, since that time. But that worked really well, letting people be on their own and then also giving them help when they needed it. And with tuned in therapists who have an expanded point of view and are, and are um, very sensitive to what's going on with people, it can, it can work in that format. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But that's definitely not a rave party. <laughs> it's not, yeah. not very people. different. Very we actually yeah, just really. found out that uh, somebody's trying to do a group group therapy um, study with AIDS survivors, people long term oh. AIDS sufferers uh-huh. in San Francisco. So doing a similar model, I think, to the PTSD studies with MDMA, but adding in a, a larger group component. Um, one mm-hmm. of our past guests uh, was that Gabby. Kyle? Yeah, I, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering too if it was they would get it individually and then they come together and then have group process. Yeah, That's well, what more like. coming soon on that as that gets approved. Yeah. Uh, I think it looks good that it will get approved, so that that'll be a great mm-hmm. thing to talk about. Um, but yeah, mm-hmm. I, the power of group is kind of just obvious with our background in breath work, so um, it only makes sense to us. I think. Well. Whether we're doing breath work or pure MDMA um, or meditation, it's our intention <laughs> that it it really powers it in terms of what we're what we're moving towards. And then when a group gets together, all with a similar intention for psycho spiritual growth, then it amplifies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And how has that experience influenced your work now, maybe with like sitting with people in extreme states because, you know, maybe sitting with somebody on MDMA or um, sitting, I know, personally from breath work, like people can get into these extreme states and, um, you know, that that sort of training kind of, you know, uh, gives you some sort of framework to work around, I guess I'm trying to say. Yeah. So in the early 80s, I was already aware of the spiritual emergency network that Stan and Christina Groff had started in 1980. And I'd read uh, Groff. In fact, I was, I was doing some uh, work within the spiritual emergency network early on. So uh, I, I would say that there's a lot of different ways that people get into these extreme states. And I experienced it early on in my 20s, well, even before my 20s, in terms of people who were extremely dedicated to meditation, some of them moving into extreme states where they really lost control at, uh, in a negative way, meaning that they did things that would, could have harmed themselves, like going out to meditate in the middle of traffic or um, just becoming almost catatonic because they were so... Uh, convinced that in order to heal themselves, they just needed to meditate more. Mm. And of course, with some of our psychological issues, that just doesn't work because most of our trauma comes in relationship. And in order to move through that kind of trauma and integrate it and leave it behind, uh, we have to heal in our relationships. So, So anyway, I learned a lot about extreme states First of all, being part of a spiritual community and noticing how some people would do spiritual bypassing. In other words, try to heal everything through meditation or their yoga practice and not working with their psychological material that just absolutely has to be integrated if we're going to move and be stable in higher states of consciousness. So, so that had a, uh, was a great preparation for me right there. Uh, the extreme states of living in a dysfunctional family where my father was an alcoholic um, and various people played various roles in order to <laughs> tolerate that. You know, that was also a study in extreme states <laughs> to some degree, although negative, it was still uh, a study. And then certainly um, the work that I was doing, I didn't say much about this, but I was really exploring al- alternate therapies, alternative therapies, even before I got to graduate school. So um, working with some of the best practitioners in neo reikian therapy, I learned a lot about um, extreme states, not only going through them myself, because I was in therapy and I really needed it, and that kind of therapy worked for me, but also then training to be a neo reikian therapist, 
I was pre I was watching a lot of people. This is one to one therapy. Um, and of course, when we were training, we did it like a fishbowl. So there'd be a circle of, of wannabe therapists and then an, a superior therapist working with a client who was then in the fishbowl being observed. So I saw a lot of extreme states at that particular time. And then, um, but the, so by the time I reached graduate school, I was already, I was in my mid thirties and was quite aware of the, the world of extreme states and extremely interested in how do you assist people to integrate those, not only have them because having them is, you know, can, can be an altering experience, but unless you integrate it, it can, it can also throw you into chaos and be extremely disturbing. So uh, the integration phase became extremely interesting to me. And then I was, I was selected to um, coordinate two conferences at Esalen, which brought together Stan, Christina Graf, the Hendricks, um, you know, psychiatrists, psychologists, spiritual teachers, a psychic who was um, extreme, uh, extremely useful in terms of giving us uh, information, but really looking at how do you help people in spiritual emergency. And we were literally looking at it from the point of view of those who take MDMA as well mm -hmm. as, and, and, uh, and or LSD, as well as those people who enter into extreme states from other doorways. And then... Um, so people at that time, this, so this is 1985, were extremely interested in, well, what's the language of this world of extreme states? And how can we look at the most positive side of it? And the most positive side of it will come about when people integrate their experiences of extreme states. And then how do we provide some kind of a language for this territory that has nothing to do really with psychopathology. Mm. If uh, psychopathology might enter in if people don't integrate it. Right. So, but, but, uh, uh, but an extreme state within itself is not a symptom of psychopathology. <laughs> so, um, so I went through graduate school <clears throat> really right in that boiling in that pot along with, um, fortunately, a lot of professionals who were also trying to sort it out at the same time. And uh, I came out of it doing my, my uh, dissertation on how to help effectively help people in spiritual emergency, mm. which drew on both those two coordinated conferences. So it wasn't just my wisdom, it was, right, it was collating the wisdom of all the people who've been there as best I could. So it set me up, I think, to understand the nature of extreme states when people come at it from different points of view and also really be able to articulate what do you do to help someone who's in that state. And right around the same time, <clears throat> that was the 70s and 80s, uh, Satyria was being explored, which is um, a residential treatment for first break psychotics. Generally young people who were not in a, a close relationship and were having their first break. And it might've been because they had taken um, a drug and not been able to integrate it. It could have been because they'd had trauma that they weren't able to integrate. It, it was for multiple reasons that they would come in but they found at Soteria House that the, what worked the best in terms of assisting someone to move out of that extreme state is um, relationship. Mm, yeah. <laughs> relationship where someone is there with you. And they called it being with. That that was the therapeutic modality was being with. But they stayed completely away from the language of therapy and psychopathology. In fact, they hired people who were paraprofessionals. You know about this, Kyle, very well. But they were hiring um, professionals who had not had graduate school education <laughs> and who had not trained their mind to think in terms of pathology. Right. Uh, so unfortunately, that's what happens in graduate school. You get to uh, immediately associate someone with a particular category of pathology starting with yourself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, 
so anyway, the Satyria, I think, really gave us a tremendous framework for, for seeing that people in extreme states need someone to just be with them and be able to tolerate altered states of consciousness without getting judgmental or reactive. Um, people also who could maintain a sense of boundary, for instance, no, I'm not going to uh, be here while you violate yourself or me, or no, we aren't going to have sex together. So there were some very simple boundaries, but outside of that, there was a tremendous amount of permission to just um, be in the extreme state until you weren't in it anymore and be able to explore it. And the professionals who worked at Satyria were chosen because they could also maintain this sense of positivity, like you're going through something that's extreme, but you're going to come out the other side with something, you know, a kind of life that is qualitatively better than what you had before. That's really exciting. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that kind of positive framework was um, also a notable qualification for the job and was, they believed that that, that had a, a an immensely positive influence in terms of the outcomes that of these people who were at Satyria. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, when I was reading about it and I was able to hear Lauren Mosher and some of the people who worked with them and talk with them directly, I just felt like that's, that's the missing piece right there. And, mm -hmm. and then Lauren Mosher went on to really write about it. And I think he created through his writing, and especially since he was a psychiatrist, he created a very credible model for the ideal way to be with people who are in extreme states in order to help them integrate what they needed to integrate and then move on. Mm -hmm. But um, unfortunately, his uh, funding got taken away and he was no longer able to move ahead with Satyria. And... Um, people now in reflection will say that it's because he diminished, well, yeah, I guess I could, I could say that he diminished the value of, of the um, psychiatric drugs. In other words, he thought that actually they could inhibit integration. Mm. And by making such a statement, uh, he was actually politically not correct in his, in his time. Uh, because the National Institutes of Mental Health that was funding him, they were going in the direction of, we're going to find the answer and it's going to be in psychiatric drugs. And that's where we want to go. So they wanted to downplay the success of the Satyria House. But if you look into the results they had, people were able to move through their process and come out the other side better more well integrated, there was less recidivism, less returning to hospitals, less need for psychiatric medications, higher quality of life, and all told, it was actually much less expensive. In other words, much more economical for people to be treated that way. So if we look at it now from the standpoint of here we are in 2016, almost 17, where current news uh, tells us that the psychiatric meds are not uh, giving us the answer that we hoped. Uh, we have to look at, well, what do we know about that has worked? Yeah. <laughs> and the Satyria model is a really fabulous model for something that has worked and that is economical and that doesn't lead to people being chronically on psych meds. And I follow Robert Whitaker's work and Robert Whitaker in, in his books has made it very plain that if someone is over the long term using psych meds, it's likely to cut down their lifespan by 20 to 25 years and lead to cognitive difficulties as well as systemic failure. Yeah. So that's, um, that's a really important thing for people to know when they're, when they're choosing how to move through an extreme state. It may seem uh, kind of seductive to like take a pill, you'll feel better in about an hour. <laughs> yeah. But on the other hand, if people continue to make use of that um, over a period of time, it can really debilitate them. Mm -hmm. And of course, then debilitate 
their not only their quality of life, but the quality of their relationships and their relationship to the world. Yeah. Yeah. And this stuff is, seems really relevant. I just had a, um, a talk with some folks about how, how do we integrate some of this spiritual language, um, you know, around maybe like psychedelic use or spiritual emergence and then bring it to people. So we are re reducing harm and risks. So bringing this type of language to people in professional roles, maybe um, clinicians, doctors, um, even like law enforcement, because they have they definitely butt up against people with uh, spiritual emergence breaks or maybe they're interacting with people on psychedelics. So it's like, how do we educate these folks to maybe bring the spiritual emergence topic into um, light? Um, and, you know, I, I brought up the fact that I, I did work at um, a Soteria in Vermont and we did try to do some outreach and, you know, it, it was a little bit receptive, but, you know, there were definitely a lot of skeptical people of like, you know, because we're, we're not a culture that accepts this, uh, I guess, this, this framework. And so, um, you know, it seems like you, you do a lot of training with people um, within this realm. And do you get a lot of people that are in these professional roles that are interested? Or how do you normally frame this to, like, integrate these two worlds? Great question. And unfortunately, I, um, I, I think it's, it's definitely a work in progress. In other words, the, the language has not been, um, if, if it's been found, it hasn't been agreed on. So yeah. I, I think, for instance, for, for law enforcement, you know, using the language of spiritual emergency is way outside their reference points. Um, the people that usually come to me I, are people with lived experience with extreme states and that could be um, a mixture of having explored some kind of psychedelics but also having recognized that they they had to move into extreme states in other ways as well so it wasn't just informed or created by um, or stimulated by by psychedelics and then I also have actually more and more licensed psychotherapists and psychiatrists coming mm. to take the training, which has been really interesting. It's like um, admission of, hey, we really need to learn about this stuff, and we didn't learn it in graduate school, <laughs> and and this language can work for us really well. So a, a good thing about using the word spiritual is that it's outside of the the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, because in some ways that Bible or that um, dictionary of psychopathology is just uh, not comfortable with the word spiritual. So you might see it mentioned one or two times, but that's it. So, um, so naming it spiritual emergency, these extreme states as a spiritual emergency, is positive because it's outside the framework of psychopathology. But then on the other hand, there are so many people these days who are allergic to the word <laughs> spiritual. Right. And, and they think, oh, if, if you use the word spiritual, there must be something a little strange or it must be a covert religion um, or referring to religion in a covert way. So... Uh, I've, I've had people come to me, uh, I'm thinking specifically of, of uh, having been in Holland last year at the Crazy Wise Conference, which was all about helping people in extreme states. And several of the people there said to me, you know, our culture in Holland is just really kind of anti-religion right now, and we don't like the word spiritual. I think it's better to call it something like uh, transformational crisis. Hmm. So that works. It's a little long, um, you know, <laughs> but still it, that works. And then, um, maybe an evolutionary crisis because hmm. it is something that people go through on the way to having a higher quality of life. So we could call it an evolutionary crisis, but then I don't think either one of those would also ap uh, appeal to law professionals, you know, transformational crisis or evolutionary crisis. I mean, give me a break. That's outside their frame of reference. So I think um, those of us who are working in this field are really struggling right now to sort out what what is the language that works for everybody. 
but more and more people, especially since, you know, news is coming out about not only MDMA and its pure form as being uh, useful uh, in therapy, but also LSD and possibly even some other psychedelics, you know, that people are saying, wow, okay, so this may be positive, and then what language do we use for it? Mm -hmm. Psychedelic therapy or... Uh, I, I think uh, everyone is, is kind of in the same bucket of trying to figure out what words to put on it. Um, I'm comfortable with spiritual emergency because the, Gro the Groffs and their spiritual emergency network, I think, were really formative. Mm -hmm. And about spiritual emergency. And it makes sense to me that, that people are going not only through a psychological um, experience, but also something that contributes to them bringing more meaning and purpose into their lives, which we usually call spiritual, a spiritual process. Mm -hmm. But okay. it's a struggle right now to sort out what language. And, uh, and I'm constantly actually working with that when, I, when I'm doing outreach, is how do I frame this in a way where people recognize the importance of it today. Yeah. And, and I think it's important too, because, you know, the, these substances are reaching major headlines. And I think for people that like really study this and research it, they understand that it's um, done in a clinical setting. It's done in a very specific uh, way, maybe ceremonially, you know, there's ways to go about doing it to get a positive effect and maybe that um you know people that just read it and then they think these things um can give them a positive experience to go out and recreate with it and then maybe they do end up in spiritual emergence in some sense or they have a really profound experience and don't know how to integrate it um so i, I think this is a really important topic now now that there's more traction in the psychedelic world and in the therapy world for this stuff i think well it I heard one person say recently that unless people have uh, using ecstasy or other psychedelics, unless they have a really appropriate integration phase, then their experience is recreational. It's not going to really help them in terms of their own personal or spiritual growth. And I tend to believe that. And I, I know that doesn't work all across the board for everybody. But I, I, I think that integration is absolutely key for people to really get what is being offered through these um, therapeutic modalities, which are using psychedelics. And, um, and how people come by that kind of training in order to help uh, others integrate is and really interesting to me, and I know that there, there are more organizations like yours that are helping people to integrate, but um, I'll just, just say I, I think that, again, going back to the model that came through Satyria and also that came through, you know, helping people in breathwork because mm -hmm. breathwork is always done in partnership. You have someone sitting with you as you're going ex doing the exploration and that person is, again, simply being with you in a positive, um, their presence being a reminder that this is an experience you're going through that's going to assist you to move to a higher level and holding that positive framework. So there's consistency in those two models. And that's exactly the same model that I think should be used for integrating the psychedelic experiences is okay here we are you're going through an extreme state you're going to come back better on the on the other side and uh and i'm here for you mm -hmm. so i just said that in a couple seconds but of course <laughs> getting the training so that you're really comfortable in doing that and managing some of the extreme states that can come up is it takes a little bit longer i think right yeah <laughs> and that's that's why I decided to to offer that kind of training for um, spiritual emergence coaches, so that they can understand more the whole landscape of it and be able to be there in a responsible way, 
And I also do some review, as you know, Kyle, <laughs> some review of people in, in terms of uh, recognizing do they have stability? Are they really ready for, for uh, being with other people in extreme states? And, um, and it's, an, it's a highly responsible position to be in. And actually one I think that demands a certain refinement in one's own consciousness to be able to really be with people in extreme states. Mm -hmm. So I, I take the training quite seriously and, um, and try to give people a, a good amount of education and background as well as practical experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's my promo. I won't do it anymore. anymore. <laughs> No, no, it's totally fine. <laughs> because you also offer some courses on um, psychedelics. Like I, you just had a webinar um, about ibogaine, correct? And right, yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> the organization I lead, Integrative Mental Health for You, is is really oriented towards assisting people to become more um, competent in in helping people in extreme states and helping themselves in extreme states or family members. And um, so one section that we have is, or is really about spiritual emergency. And another section is about um, assisting people who have been diagnosed with certain pathologies. But I, I became extremely interested in the Ibogaine after meeting some practitioners this year and then recognizing that in the state of Vermont, where we have a, a huge problem with addiction to opiates, that they're actually discussing in the state legislature having a pilot program where Ibogaine would be used um, because it seems to have 60 to 70 percent success rate in interrupting addiction to opiates, which is about, you know, uh, at least 100 percent better than any other program. So um, since learning about that and connecting with the woman who is educating the legislature in Vermont, I've also heard that the state of New York has the same thing, uh, discussion going on in its legislature. And there's someone in, in New Hampshire um, who's also wanting to introduce the same dialogue. So I thought, wow, this may be some bush that came from West Africa, but on the other hand, it's really profound in terms of its its healing ability if done in the right set and setting and with integration <laughs> so um i got very excited about it and then posted a, a a relatively short course on ibogaine in in which i also interview a psychiatrist who is um a consultant to several of the clinics who are, that are using ibogaine as well as talking to someone who was an addict on heroin and um, had a, a, a really dark time in his life before he then got out of that and became a counselor for other addicts. And now he's also working with, with Ibogaine. So it's a, it's, I'm, I'm trying to open people up to the, the potential that's there and recognizing that actually amongst the people that I know, very few knew about Ibogaine, like mm. myself. I was yes. really ignorant about it a year ago. <laughs> yeah and, and i think i remember you saying too that um while you're doing a lot of the spiritual emergence training that people were asking about a lot of psychedelic use like i i, I think maybe you're saying at uh, one of the practicums that in australia there's a lot of like interest in ayahuasca and stuff like that and those that is that correct well yeah you you remember correctly there was and and I think people were actually kind of discreet, you know, in talking about it at first, as in not wanting to talk about it in the circle of people who had come together for the course, that they were really uh, kind of taking me aside at a break and saying, oh, by the way, can I use some of this stuff in working with people who are coming back from ayahuasca experiences? And what do you think about that? Because it's not legal in Australia either. So... People were trying to talk to me in a discreet way, but I, I've encouraged people to come out with their knowledge of um, the difficulties people are having who are coming back from these retreats where they might take ayahuasca three or four times 
and then struggling to integrate the profound changes that they've gone through, especially if they've taken this in Peru, let's say, and then they come back to the United States, they're in a culture that says, no, it's illegal. And in fact, ayahuasca has no therapeutic value at all. So obviously you were just involved in a huge hallucination. And to be able to integrate within that atmosphere in the United States is really, or Australia, is really challenging. So um, plus that, that in, in Australia, they mentioned that there were a lot of younger people under 20 who thought, hey, this is going to be cool. I'm not going to go to the amusement park. I'm going to take ayahuasca this weekend, you know. <laughs> and so their intention would be for amusement, but then they would enter into a really deep experience and then have absolutely no footing at all. And then how do you help someone like that? And also help them in a way where you're in a culture where it's illegal. So you can't advertise that you're condoning ayahuasca in any way, but um, but you want to help those people who have had the experience. So anyway, there are, I think, within the group that are coming to me to get training in coaching those in spiritual emergence, there are a notable number of people who've had the experience themselves and tried to work through it and uh, with some difficulty, or they've just had people coming to them and saying, help, help, <laughs> I'm at a loss, I really need help. So I'm, I'm very happy to, ha to be able to have that conversation with people and bring it out in the open and, and use the training actually to um, tailor something that's really right for those people who are having psychedelic experiences and needing integration. Yeah, that's really great that you offer that service. And it's definitely probably really helpful for the community. Thank you, Kyle. Well, I honor what you're doing within that too. It's, and both you and Joe having these conversations is really fabulous. Oh, thank Making you. it very available and accessible to people. Yeah. Um, I had kind of a tangential question. And I, I think you and Kyle maybe had some dialogue about it a bunch of months ago related to our uh, kind of show byline, um, Psychology of the Future Now. It's kind of a spin off of Stan Groff's Psychology of the Future book. He, he gave it a uh, kind of inflammatory title just so it would get any attention. Um, otherwise, <laughs> it probably would have just been boring and, and left alone. But Psychology of the Future is kind of audacious to say that kind of thing, especially, you know, um, when s psychiatric meds were as popular and, and booming as they were at that point in time. Um, and I, I had wanted to have a conversation with you for a bit about, you know, what, what do I think psychology of the future looks like? What, do, what do you think it looks like? And, and, um, you know, it, it's a really hard question. Cause is it, you know, are we talking three years out, a hundred years out, 500 years out? Like what, what it looks like 500 years from now, I think is very different from what's happening now and, and three years from now. Um, but what, what, what do you have for, for thoughts on that matter? Like what, what do you think the, the psychedelics field might look like in, in 20 years or, or 50 or, or psychology as a whole, however you want to jump into that. You know, I know it's huge. Don't wow. feel like you have to answer all of it, but, uh, <laughs> it <laughs> was a conversation I, I had like running around in my head for months going, I really want to dig into that with Emma at some point. Oh. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, However you want. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Um, we, this is going to uh, ping pong me back into my my uh, experience as a, as a meditator, which started, as I said, about 50 years ago. And, um, and more recently, I've been very involved with a self-realization fellowship. And they basically say in not in their uh, in the, in um, several different ways that all of us are crazy until we become really anchored in what they would call God, but that is, could be translated as um, that energy which is infinite, which is highly intelligent and highly loving. So it doesn't have to be called God and doesn't have to remind us of churches, but it is an energy and it's actually the same energy that Reich talked about and the same energy that comes up for people in breath work when they move into high places of 
letting that universal energy move through them completely without any blockages. So until, again, to use it in that framework, until we become anchored and able to fully bring through that energy and live into the consciousness that comes with our being one with it, we're all somewhat crazy. <laughs> so, um, so then the next step is, in my thinking, then how do, you, how do you assist people to move into that state of being able to be one with that universal consciousness in a safe manner and in an effective manner? That's the next step, right? Um, if we're going to move out of our craziness. And I see, you know, psychedelics used in the right set and setting. In other words, with a, um, a sitter who is, or a therapist and or therapist <laughs> who are really well educated and a, um, a person who is well prepared to do the experience. In other words, they've really articulated their intention to move into that higher state. Uh, that that uh, those kinds of mm, situations with the right set and setting can just be profound in terms of healing as well as propelling people into higher states. So I would see that as, as important in the psychology of the future. And I would also see that giving people meditation technologies that really work is an extremely important part of the psychology of the future. And when I was in dialogue with the practitioners at, at certain Ibogaine clinics and asked what do you um, and asked about the experience that people have, I was told, well gee, some sometimes you know people will take these psychedelics and in the positive frame, when they have a positive experience, they like it's like making the screen of their life blank again. They come up with, wow, I'm free of all that garbage. And mm. I'm free of the desire to take cocaine or heroin right now or opiates. How cool. And then they come up with now what? And the people who are uh, in charge of integration are the ones that can assist the clients or participants, whatever you want to call them, in answering that question of now what? What's important? And it seems to me that introducing meditation at that point, especially a technology that would assist in higher consciousness and the discipline that's needed to use it would be very appropriate, <laughs> but it's not being done very much. Mm -hmm. So um, I, would, I would hope that that would be brought in and that people would really be able to be educated about the positive nature of certain technologies for meditation. And I think the way it's done right now, and I may be really ignorant and out of touch, but the way it's done right now is a little bit of a shotgun scatter effect, which is, hey, you got a blank screen, you don't have addiction anymore, you want to know what's positive? Well, you could do this, 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 this. And here's the menu, you know, of life. And, and it can be just flat overwhelming. And how does a person choose um, what's really going to be important and effective? So on that note, Joe, I took Stan Groff's course um, that he gave on psychology of the future in the fall because I wanted to be like up to date, you know, and I really honored the man. Um, and one of the th he talked obviously about transpersonal psychology because he's considered one of the founders of it and how you know we we have been able to broaden out from freud and go into the transpersonal and also go into psychedelic therapy and that um recognize that our pre-birth and birth experience is is extremely important and maybe even past lifetimes are important all of that's fabulous but at a certain point i said to myself wait a minute here, he's been involved with meditation for a long period of time. Why isn't he talking about meditation? Mm. And he's in such a powerful position to impact people. Um, he could suggest a certain form of meditation as something that could really guide people into, into stabilizing in these higher states. Why isn't he doing that? 
And um, that question never got answered fully, but mm. I submitted it. <laughs> and so I think this, to, to go back and really say it clearly, if I can, uh, the psychology of the future is going to have a technology to help people not only move to that higher state of consciousness in meditation, but stabilize there. And psychedelics may, ha may have a really important role to play. And also in the psychology of the future, we'll have a lot more of peer um, work. So people who can have a po really positive relationships with others who are going through disturbing experiences and be able to basically uplift them into a more comfortable position in terms of being able to have a positive, nurturing, supportive relationship, which, which it means for some people that they're learning for the first time how to be in relationship. And for others, it might be, oh, God, thank God I'm out of that negative environment and I can create, I, I'm reminded of what a positive relationship is and I can create my whole social environment from a positive perspective now. So I see those three elements as being super important and that in some situations, psychotherapy or um, workshops that really assist people to go deeper into their own psychology, um, shamanic work. There are all kinds of things that, that can help us. But why but, not pick something that has some data behind it as being an effective tool? Um, like, I think that's your point. Like we're going to know, you know, X meditation technique seems appropriate for 95% of the population. So why not pitch that specifically and people can bolt on their own stuff later as they see fit. I, th I think I understand a little, like I kind of identify with why Groff isn't pushing stuff, but at the same point, you're right. It's a missed opportunity. Like you, you have this leadership position. Why not push something in particular in my, in my mind, like because I've been around his work for a bit, I feel like Jack Cornfield style Buddhism and that kind of meditation is kind of de facto part of his world. Cause I, I went to a workshop where both of them were there and we did a ton of meditation and a, ton, a bunch of breath work and a lot of like uh satsang style. Is that the right word? Satsang yeah. style, like group, uh, I almost want to call oh. it preaching, but <laughs> it's kind of like not preaching okay. parable telling. And it was just lovely. Yeah. And why, why not have that kind of postmodern flair on Buddhism and psychedelic work? Like it's, I think that might be the trick. I, I personally have a hard time saying like reality is X and I don't want to tell somebody who's new to this work that, you know, this is the way the world is because I'm not so certain at all that anything is other than science. We don't have too much to say like, you know, <laughs> what, what the world is and it's still a lot missing. So I don't want to put that on people because I'm, I'm kind of trying to be model agnostic, but technique is kind of model neutral and it's especially when you're seeing beneficial effects that lower stress and and you know just generally make you happier and less disturbed why not that's kind of like the point of positive psychology yes. and it's really the point of a lot of the psychedelic work too you know reading reading this book tom schroeder's uh acid test hopefully i got it right that time um yeah. following the the soldier with PTSD in that narrative, he really wanted additional doses um, of the therapy with the people who ran it with him. I think it was Michael and Annie Midhofer, but it wasn't legally available. So he just kind of went deep into his art, went, went a little dark after a while. But, you know, I think he's still alive and kicking and a proponent, active proponent of psychedelic psychotherapy but if he had these meditation tools perhaps the effect would have lasted permanently or at least a lot longer i yeah so i i um just wanted to reiterate i i don't believe that a, a person needs to necessarily follow a particular religion or you have to get to the right meditation through a religion uh i'm not saying that but 
there are technologies <laughs> that have come through to us through ancient times that work. And um, really not only introducing that as in, oh yeah, for dessert, there's this, <laughs> um, but, but really saying, you know, this is an extraordinary phase you're in right now of being able to make some new decisions about how you want to lead your life. And here's the research maybe on what people get from meditation and here's what it demands. And we really feel like we want to encourage you to look seriously at this. And so let's have a satsang or let's have a truth, you know, a gathering around talking about the, the deepest truth and talk about some of the values that can come from this. And also, where do we go in life without it? <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What happens in life city. if we don't have something like that? Yeah. So, anyway. I, well, I, I, I like that approach. That's really interesting, saying, like, maybe you just have some sort of boring-looking white paper with fact, and say, <laughs> here's the research, here's the technique. Um, that's what we have. And, you know, the, in marketing speak, there's this thing, paradox of choice. And I think a lot of people uh -huh. in the spiritual world have that problem. It's jumping between a hundred different traditions and, you know, no real depth, but a lot of surface. But if you limit that choice, maybe give them two options or just one option, maybe they'll jump right in with uh, enthusiasm. I think, I think nowadays meditation is kind of just well recognized as being great for just about everybody. So, in the, plenty of data. Yeah, so but why not? you know, mo most of the um, research that's out there has been done on mindfulness meditation, and right. uh, my mindfulness is fabulous for helping people ground, which can be extremely important after, let's say, psychedelic experience, uh, when people aren't feeling particularly grounded. So, um, it's great for that as well as moving into a frame of reference where you're not judging yourself as much as maybe you were trained to do early in life. But on the other hand, if your intention is to move into higher states of consciousness, mindfulness isn't necessarily the best one to go to. So again, I'm standing on my soapbox here because I have some strong beliefs about it. <laughs> but uh, you, were, you were asking me about psychology of the future, so I, I wanted to let you know what my own personal thoughts were about that. Um, yeah, it might be too divergent. Well, maybe we'll ask you in email later, but like which, which particular techniques you might push people towards and, um, and why, and we'd like to share that with the audience. Absolutely. So, um, it, anything quick, particular techniques, self, Yogananda, so self-realization fellowship, largely in California, um, was what you mentioned earlier. Is that the form of meditation you would... Yeah, well, actually, what they suggest is participating in the lessons that it seems a little bit outdated because it's not digitized, but they actually come through snail mail. But it gives people an opportunity to do something once a week that comes through the mail and, uh, and then to prepare themselves so they have a cognitive framework and then move into the meditations at the appropriate time within that cognitive framework. So it's a little bit of satsang without being face to face, you know. Right. And there's a lo a lot more to be said about it, but um, yes, to answer your question, yes, self realization fellowship, I think, ha is one of the most effective answers. Cool. And uh, I'm I'm recognizing that we're kind of moving into a zone. I have to do something soon, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. um, I'm happy to talk to you about it. Uh, in another context or another time. Um, it's one of my favorite things to talk about, but I, I need to also be the oriented a little bit more until time today. Yeah, no problem at all. Um, and Kyle, if you want to kind of close. Yeah, it was just, uh, just any way to get in touch with you for the listeners, um, what's your website, or if you have any upcoming events that you just want to pitch really quick. Hmm. Well, the website are the um, initials for the organization. So that's I as in image, M as in Mary, H as in Harry, and U as in upside down dot org. <laughs> IMHU dot org stands for Integrative Mental Health for You. 
and we are a, a not not for profit um, educational organization. And I have another training coming up in January that is five online webinars, which is part A of two parts for to become um, certified as a spiritual emergence coach. And then part B is a two day live practicum, and I'm giving that in Berkeley in March, early March. So people can just go to imhu.org forward slash courses to find out more. And um, that's the promo I want to give other than awesome. <laughs> it's really a pleasure to be with both of you. And again, I, I really honor what you're doing. It's great. Likewise. And thanks so much for uh, giving your time and sharing everything with us today. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, I thanks also really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Really nice to be with both of you.